Tynecastle Park and the beginning of another campaign in the history of a football club. A history that is greater in substance, spirit and soul than any other in Scotland. Once again, the boys in Maroon have done themselves proud and a successful season has been savoured over the summer. But in soccer, the summer break is only a short one. And soon enough, the empty terraces of Tynecastle will echo to the roar of the fans and come alive again, roused in a flood of emotion as a new season gets underway. The feeling among the players will be familiar, but one that is unique, for it is a feeling that can only come from a real history, an era of more than 100 years steeped in the blood, the sweat and the tears of generations who have entered through the doors and been a part of the glory of the heart of Midlothian Football Club. Edinburgh today is one of the finest and most famous of capital cities. Its familiar landmarks and historical architecture are renowned throughout the world. Under the reassuring gaze of the great castle above, Princess Street stretches like a colourful parade. There are shops that sell everything that money can buy, and a bustling transport system that goes about its daily business. Black and rocket-shaped, a monument stands towering above the tourists and shoppers, quietly watching over the hustle and bustle below. It was erected in honour of one of Edinburgh's most famous writers, Sir Walter Scott. Scott published his first historical novel, Waverley, in 1814, and this was followed by a string of others, including Ivanhoe, Rob Roy, and perhaps his most famous book of all, The Heart of Midlothian. The book was a masterpiece that has become a national epic. The origin of the football club's title is to be found in Edinburgh's most historic thoroughfare. Few stop to see or even notice the curious shape the cobblestones take at one particular place. In the high street in the old town, the cobbled Causeway stones are a reminder, as in many cities, of an age gone by. Today, professional men and city financiers mingle with the tourists, surrounded by much of that same architecture that has bordered the street for centuries. In the days of Sir Walter Scott, the High Street was dominated by the Tower of St Giles Cathedral. It was under its shadow that there stood the Tollbooth of Edinburgh, a jail which was known locally as the Heart of Midlothian. The cobblestones we spoke of are in the shape of a heart, and a reminder of those who, in the words of Scott, honoured with their residence that most venerable edifice. Nearly 60 years later, at a meeting place known as the Tron Kirk, a group of lads who frequented a dance club that had been named after the Tollbooth made the historic decision to form a football team. It all started back in the 1870s when football was becoming increasingly popular in the side of Scotland. Teams were springing up everywhere and hearts developed out of a group of friends who were kicking a ball around on the East Meadows. Once they decided to start a team, they had to find a name for it, and the name Heart of Midlothian was eventually chosen, and the right good choice it was. But once they had got a name, they had to find a captain, and a fairly novel way of deciding the captaincy was chosen. They had a one-to-one -one football competition, and the finalists ended up being Jake Reed, the goalkeeper, and Tom Purdy. Tom Purdy won the competition, and his name is associated as being the founder of Hearts. While Tynecastle today stands as a proud home to a century of achievement for Hearts in Scottish football, the team's original ground was a much more humble affair altogether. 
Football began for Hearts at the East Meadows, a public park which they shared with other clubs, including their great rivals, Hibernian. But even today, the meadows are as popular a playing surface as they were all those years ago, and of course, a sure breeding ground for the stars of the future. By 1875, Hearts were well established, and to commemorate their joining the Scottish Football Association and playing in the Scottish Cup for the first time, the players lined up for the first ever team photograph. Although looking at the all-white strip and long trousers, one could be forgiven for mistaking them for a cricket team. After disbanding briefly in 1876, Hearts re-emerged in 1877, sporting a strip changed to red, white and blue hoops. And in April the following year, with jerseys that had been dyed to the familiar maroon of today, Tom Purdy proudly led his men to win the club's first trophy, the Edinburgh Cup, when they defeated Hibernian 3-2 in the fourth replay of the final. Towards the end of the century, Edinburgh society reveled in the artistic performances in music and song with which it has long been associated. Exhibitions, festivals and concerts were a regular occurrence. Hearts were by now very much a part of the Edinburgh scene, and this was illustrated by an annual concert that was held every year between 1879 and 1901. These were popular occasions and well supported by all connected with the club. The next job was to find the ground and in the early days we played in public parks around Edinburgh, went down to Powburn, had our own ground at Powder Hall, before moving here to the Gorgie area in the 1880s. Because of the extension of the Edinburgh tram services around this time, the club were able to make this move out of town. However, the original Tyne Castle ground is now an abundance of bustling buildings lying between Wardlaw Street and Wardlaw Place, less than a stone's throw from today's thronged terraces. Even as long ago as 1882, football teams had their stars and the game of soccer had its superstars. Hart's captain in that year was Nick Ross, a strong attacking fullback whose tactics were said to have laid the foundations of scientific soccer. He is acknowledged to have been one of the first players to use the pass back to the goalkeeper. Ross was one of several players lost to English clubs. This forced Hearts to make illegal payments to top men, and in October 1884, Hearts became the first club to be suspended, albeit briefly, for professionalism an illegal act under the Scottish Football Association rules. Having moved to the new ground on the 4th of April 1886, Hearts won their first home game, beating Bolton Wanderers 4-1 with goals by Henderson, McNeil and Tommy Jenkinson who scored twice. Jenkinson, part of the Hearts team that regained the championship of the East in 1889, was also the club's first international player representing Scotland in a 4-1 victory over Ireland in February 1887. Hearts were one of the founding members of the Scottish League in 1890, and that season the team captained by Johnny Hill won the coveted Scottish Cup for the first time, beating joint league champions Dumbarton 1-0 in the final. The cup success was closely followed the next season when Hearts won the Shield and the Charity Cup. The quality of the players was recognised in 1891 when Isaac Begbie, Johnny Hill, John McPherson and Davy Baird were all selected to play for the national team against England at Blackburn. Never since have so many Hearts players represented their country at the same time against the old enemy. With all the success, there was still one trophy that Heart of Midlothian wanted to win more than any other. Finally, in the 1894-95 season, it was this team that won the Scottish League Championship for the first time. They were totally dominant throughout a season in which, at one stage, they won 11 games in a row, 
which included a 1-0 win at Ibrox and a 2-0 victory at Celtic Park, plus a further thrashing of Celtic when they beat them 4-0 at Tynecastle towards the end of the season. In the last years of the 19th century, we had a fair bit of success winning both the league and the Scottish Cup on two or three occasions. For Hearts supporters, the most important one was undoubtedly the 1896 Scottish Cup final, which was in fact the only Scottish Cup final not played in Glasgow. And it was Hearts played Hibs, we won it 3-1, and we've actually got the ball in the trophy cabinet. And here it is, the actual ball used in the match. Very different from the type we use nowadays, but it was put into the Hibs net three times on that day, and the Hearts supporters will never forget it. In front of a crowd of 17,000, the match had even greater significance, as Hibs had only just joined Hearts in the first division that season. The game took place at Logie Green in Edinburgh, and was also noted for being the only time the Scottish Cup final has taken place outside Glasgow. The Hearts scorers on that memorable day were Davy Baird, he's the one on the left, Willie Michael, and the third Hearts goal fell to Alex King. In 1896-97, Hearts won the Scottish League Championship for the second time. Still among the teams showing off the trophies were Davy Baird, Willie Taylor on the left, Jock Fairburn and Isaac Begbie, all of whom were veterans who went back to the 1891 Scottish Cup winning team. That particular championship win was made all the sweeter by the fact that Hibs had led the race for most of the season. Celtic, who were also in the running, fell away, and Hearts defeated Hibs at Tynecastle to bring them to within a couple of points of their great rivals. Hibs went down to St Mirren in their last match, and with Hearts taking all the points from their remaining fixtures, the championship went to the Maroons. The turn of the century saw continued success for Hearts, with a magnificent cup run in 1901, culminating in the defeat of Celtic in the final by 4-3. The winning goal was scored by Marky Bell, who eventually emigrated to Australia. It was said that he could run 100 yards in 10 seconds. The team arrived home to parade the trophy in a break hired from the Edinburgh Tramway Company. The Hearts team that set out in the 1902-03 campaign did well to take the club once again to the Scottish Cup final. Victory, alas, was not to be repeated, with the club suffering a 2-0 defeat in the second replay of a Titanic final against Rangers. Among the players that day was Charlie Thompson, one of Hearts' greatest players. He joined the club in 1898, and while at first they played centre-forward, by the time the club reached the final in 1906, Charlie had dropped back to centre-half and was by then the club captain. He went on to be capped 21 times for Scotland, 12 of them while with Hearts. Third Lanark were the opponents in the 1906 Cup final, and George Wilson was the scorer of the single goal that divided the teams. In the same season, Hearts just missed out in the double, finishing second in the league to Celtic. The year before that final, in 1905, the present limited company that owns Heart of Midlothian Football Club was formed. This brought financial stability and the means to develop the ground. Throughout this glorious period in the history of Hearts, one player stood out among them all. His name was Bobby Walker. His record and achievement was remarkable, playing in all around 650 games for Hearts. And even although he wasn't an acclaimed goal scorer, he still managed to notch up over 250 goals before he retired in 1913. As an inside forward, he was unrivaled, and this was underlined by an international career that spanned 13 years and a Hearts record of 29 caps but Walker's caps were among many won by Hearts players during this period. 
Bobby Walker and his teammates pioneered the way into Europe for Hearts as early as 1912, when in the close season the club travelled to Scandinavia. Another major landmark for Hearts came in 1914. In April of that year, the old grandstand was demolished and replaced by the structure that stands today. Designed by Archibald Leach, the final cost after completion was £12,000, an enormous amount of money in those days. This resulted in the club being forced to sell their top striker Percy Dawson to Blackburn Rovers for £2,500. There was little solace in the fact that the transfer fee was a world record at the time. Even with the sale of Dawson, the club still found itself in serious financial difficulties for many years. Dawson was just one of the many excellent signings made by manager John McCartney, who took charge in 1910. But everybody's lives were about to be affected by a greater event, which would have far graver consequences than any financial matters. 1914 saw the outbreak of the First World War, when millions laid down their lives for their countries. Perhaps the greatest moment in Hearts history came in the First World War. The heart side, which was top of the league, and a very young side, volunteered to join the forces. That act alone won them popularity in the whole of the Edinburgh area. Seven players paid the ultimate sacrifice, and very few were able to play again. Notwithstanding all this, Hearts incredibly still looked as if they were going to take the league championship in 1915. But it was too much to ask, and with their strength sapped with military training, they were overhauled by Celtic in the final weeks. Many of them joined C Company of the 16th Royal Scots, under the command of Sir George McRae. Among those that had joined up was Big Bob Mercer, Hart's outstanding player of that time and known as the mastermind of modern soccer. Since arriving at Tynecastle in 1908, he had won five league honours, as well as being capped for Scotland. Sadly, he would die as a result of gassing sustained during the war. The actions of the club won praise from all quarters. We got telegrams from Lloyd George, the King of the Belgians, and various other dignitaries of the time. The club's place in Edinburgh's hearts came as a result of that, and the Secretary of State for Scotland decided that it was time there was a memorial to what the players did. And as such, a memorial was opened in 1922 at Haymarket. The very first armistice service held there, over 40,000 people attended. And that tradition still goes on today with all the players, staff, many supporters attending a service on the 11th of November. Not long after the war, Hearts brought in a new manager, although they did manage to keep it in the family. At the tender age of 30, very young even by today's standards, William McCartney replaced his father John in November 1919. Edinburgh in the 20s held little cheer for Hearts fans. Disappointing results, poor performances, a series of players coming and going were all factors that almost led in 1922 to a drop into the second division. The period did, though, have its brighter moments. In the 1926 season, Jock White showed just how prolific his goal-scoring talents were when in a period of just 10 days he scored a hat-trick of fours a record unsurpassed in the history of British football. At the same time as McCartney was overseeing changes in the playing staff, the directors were overseeing a detailed plan to enlarge the capacity of the ground. The old iron stand was demolished and many other improvements were made. Hearts became regular winners of the Rosebery Cup during the next 10 years. 
1933 was the jubilee year of the competition and having been the first winners of the trophy, it was with extra pleasure that Hearts beat Motherwell 3-1 in the final. Edinburgh was a thriving city in the 30s. Sport by now was well established in the social calendars. Rugby internationals were attracting enormous crowds to the new stadium at Murrayfield, which had taken over from Inverleith in 1925. And not far away at Tynecastle, the Hearts were running onto the pitch to play in front of ever-increasing attendances. This very rare footage is believed to be the earliest on record of the boys in Maroon. More records were written in the 30s. There was the biggest win in senior competition in 1937 when Hearts defeated Kings Park 15-0. And on the 13th of February 1932, a record attendance of 53,396 turned out to watch Hearts in the Cup against Rangers. Hearts' brilliant individuals of the 30s could always pull in the crowds. There was Dave McCulloch, seen here with Brentford, who in a brilliant first season in 1934-35 finished top league scorer in Scotland with 38 goals. Alec Massey, one of Hart's finest wing halves and latterly with Aston Villa. And Freddie Warren, a left winger and the only Hearts player to have been capped for Wales. Then there was Barney Battles, who scored an amazing 31 goals in his first season and a record-breaking 44 league goals in 1930-31. He added his name to local folklore with 11 goals against Hibs in just four weeks in 1929. Another 30s player was Bert McGurdy. I played against Kilmarnock here in a home match and I uh, had the satisfaction of scoring the winning goal, we won 2-1. And uh, it was just, being a hard supporter, supporter all my life, it was just out of this world, it was unbelievable to be out here. And I'm playing in a team which contains so many internationalists. Andy Black, down this other end here, and Andy Black put in a shot from about 20, 25 yards. The goalkeeper sprang up to his left-hand side and palmed it out. But I was always one who ran in after a, a shot. I went in hoping something would happen and he palmed it out to the left and I was running in and from a very tight angle I squeezed it into the faraway corner. Never forget it. <laughs> but of all the stars of those years, perhaps the most famous was Tommy Walker. He came to Tynecastle in 1932, beginning an illustrious career as a player and a manager, an association with the club which was to last for over 35 years. Tommy was a great player, great player. And I got the feeling that a lot of people thought that Tommy was maybe a bit on the sort of soft side physically, but Tommy could handle himself when the occasion demanded it. 
strong, forceful player, a good, strong shot, and bent him on that man. Great player. One of Walker's most memorable goals for Scotland was against England at Wembley in 1936, when he scored a penalty equaliser in a one-all draw. Two years later, he was a national hero when he scored again at Wembley, when Scotland defeated England 1-0. In the 1935-36 season, Hearts boasted five Scottish internationals, Andy Anderson, Tommy Walker, Dave McCulloch, Alec Herd, and Alec Massey. In the Scottish Cup semi-final against Rangers in 1935, in front of a huge crowd of almost 103,000 at Hampden Park, Tommy Walker scored for the Maroons in a one-all draw that Hearts, by all accounts, should have won. Sadly, in the replay, Hearts went down to Rangers 2-0. In July of that year, manager Willie McCartney was replaced by David Pratt. Managers, though, were struggling during these times, having to sell players to fund necessary ground development. And in 1937, Frank Moss took over. Well, Frank Moss, nowadays, uh, the, the managers are there's a different... There's, there's coaches as well, and they're, they're, they're telling the players how to play, where to do, where not to go, and all this sort of thing. Whereas in these days, you had a, a pre match talk, which was really maybe sorting out somebody in the opposition. There was no saying, well, you go here, you go there, and you play this way, and you play that way. You were left to play off the top of your head. And that's how football shouldn't be played. It should be played by people who, you know, they know what they're doing, and you haven't, you haven't got to be told what to do. And that's the whole difference. In those days, when you're talking about players of the calibre of Walker, Randy Black, Andy Anderson, Jimmy Knight, all in the And I think here, it was probably about £8 a week. And the bonus would be £2 a win and a pound for the draw. And uh, in reserves, you're getting maybe £4, something like that. And you had a bonus there as well. Only three teams, only three teams paid a bonus in those days, in the, in the reserve team. And that was Hearts and Johnston and Celtic. And you were paid the princely sum of five shillings for a draw, 25 pence, and 50 pence for a win. So that was, that was the difference in there. What they get paid now, well, I just don't know, but I know it's a lot more than £6 or £8. <laughs> Hearts won in 1939 once again saw many of the Hearts players answer the call to duty. The club relied on guest appearances to put teams together. Men like Bobby Baxter, a gritty defender who often pulled on a maroon shirt within an hour of finishing his shift at Gilmerton Pit. Among other famous guests during the war period was Frank O'Donnell of Aston Villa. The club achieved some very notable results in this period before Tommy Walker went off to war, reaching the Southern League Cup final in 1940-41. On May the 11th, 1946, Hearts provisionally signed a young man from the Edinburgh mining village of New Craig Hall. His name was Willie Bald. After a time of experimenting, manager David McLean finally put the names of Con, Warthaw and Bald into the Hearts lineup for the first time in October 1948. The trio tore a shell-shocked East Fife side apart as Hearts thrashed them 6-1, with Bald scoring a debut hat-trick a feat he repeated the following week against Queen of the South. It was the beginning of a new era. The curtain had risen for the terrible trio. Bald was a classy centre forward who possessed stunning ability in the air. He and his inside forward colleagues, Alfie Conn and Jimmy Wartaw, produced firepower that no team could match, scoring 356, 219 and 375 goals respectively. Wartaw scored 206 league goals, a club record. Not a single major trophy had been won since 1906, but as a foretaste of what was to come in the 50s, Hearts were never out of the top four in the first three seasons of the decade. Here in 1950, Hearts beat Queen of the South in the third round. At Dumfries, Aird tosses, Parker of Hearts guesses wrong, and the biggest home crowd Queen of the South have ever seen cheer as Hearts in the dark jerseys kick off. Conditions are ideal for good football. Play develops down Hart's right wing as Bold receives the ball. Binning challenges, but Bold beats him and centers. At last, Hart score. A perfect pass from Conn gives Whittle a shot, and he scored to put Hart's one up.
Two minutes to half time, Hart scored again after a corner kick when Glidden hooks an awkward ball into the net. Half time, Hearts 2, Queen of the South nil. With the defence split, Conn gets an easy chance and Hearts win the game by three goals to one. Starting in the 50s, or there, uh, the, the late 40s, that the Con Balls and Wardos came along. Uh, they were household names then, you know, and uh, they were just attracted to the crowd to Tyne Castle and it's from then onwards in the, the 50s and the early 60s I mean I can mind playing for the reserves one year and there was 15,000 at that game. Finally Hearts brought home a major trophy beating Motherwell 4-2 in the Scottish League Cup final and as if to set the seal King Willie Bald once again scored a hat-trick. It's difficult to to remember that my father playing because uh, I was what six or seven years of age when he stopped playing but it was a happy time uh, a lot of good memories met a lot of nice people there was a, always a big buzz in the house with a lot of football players and different people in the press and whatever but at that time I really didn't see a lot of the football uh, it was not until later on that we appreciated exactly what had gone in the past uh, but it was good by now, Bald had become as famous as Tommy Walker as a player. Sadly, Davy McLean never reaped his reward as he died in 1951 with Walker taking full charge of the team. A lot of the players at that time, of course, had been were signed by Dave McLean before uh, Tommy Walker came on the scene. But uh, when he, uh, his own quiet way, because he was a gentleman anyway. And, uh, but the, the situation was still that uh, all the boys that were there wanted to play for the Hearts. And that was the big thing. That, uh, and he just, as he always used to say, dotted eyes and struck the teeth. That was what he was just always <laughs> come out. Then on the 21st of April 1956 came one of Hart's greatest moments. In front of 133,000 people, they met Celtic in the Scottish Cup final. The Celtic attacking before the Hart's goal mouth. The defenders get the ball away, but Celtic are soon pressing again. Hart's right half, Dave Mackay, fails to stop them. So does right back Kirk. But Kirk chases after the ball and manages to deflect it over the line. Now a Hart's attack. Alfie Conn loses it. Jimmy Wartor gets it away. He's impeded, but Mackay comes to the rescue. Alfie Conn races to beat the Celtic defence. He gets through, passes to Ian Crawford, and Crawford slams it home. Second half, with Hart battling to increase their 1-0 lead. A quick tussle and Celtic managed to clear for the moment. But centre forward Willie Ball soon brings it back down the left wing. Ball centres. Young and Fallon jump, but Crawford's there and it's another goal for Hearts. The ball goes loose and Hearts kick up field. Willie Ball beats Bobby Evans, Alfie Conn shoots, and Beattie can't save it. Hearts three, Celtic one. And that's the final score. It's 49 years since Hearts were in the final. On that occasion, it was Celtic who beat them, 3-0. Hearts have had to wait for half a century to get their revenge. Now, at last, it's theirs. And so is that precious cup. Finally, the inevitable happened when in 1957-58, Hearts won the championship for a third time. Here, seen leading the celebrations is Dave Mackay. His influence motivated a team that was awash with stars. So much of an enthusiast, Dave. He had uh, fantastic ability and uh, a very infectious spirit. You know, if, if the game wasn't going well, Dave could grab it by the scruff of the neck you know, and uh, he installed uh, something uh, himself and Bobby Parker that the Hearts didn't have after all the years that we were talking about. Uh, um, Dave was never beat, mm. never beat. Born and uh, he was always classed as a hard man, but Dave was a very good footballer as well. And uh, I certainly think that uh, in th that time, uh, um, 
pauses when the enthusiasm was put in and the bite that Hatch didn't have. They made, they made a fantastic contribution towards that. Mm -hmm. Now it's Hearts on the attack. Right winger Alex Young beats the backs and shoots. But Stewart saves brilliantly. In scoring 132 league goals, a new record was achieved. Only 29 were conceded and the result was 62 points, the highest number ever attained by any club in the first division over a 34-match programme. When all the other cup and friendly games were accounted for in that remarkable season, the final tally was 243 goals. Hart's normal championship winning side that year consisted of Kirk at fullback with his taller partner Tom McKenzie, the very dependable Gordon Marshall in goal, a half-back line which was unexcelled in winning and using the ball, comprised of Davy Mackay, Freddie Glidden and John Cumming, and a forward line which was simply the best in the country. The tricky and elusive Johnny Hamilton at outside right, a tremendous inside forward trio of Alfie Conn, King Willie Bald, Jimmy Warthaw and Ian Crawford, and in reserve, such fine players as Jimmy Milne, Bobby Parker, George Thompson, Alec Young, Jimmy Murray, Andy Bowman, and of course, Bobby Blackwood. Success didn't end with the championship. Later that year, Hearts took the League Cup for a second time, destroying Partick Thistle 5-1, with Willie Bald and Jimmy Murray each scoring twice, and little Johnny Hamilton getting the fifth goal. The first uh, league championship we won, we uh, went to Park Kerr against Celtic and Ibrox against Rangers, beat both of them and got two pounds each mm. for each match as a bonus. Mm. And we were getting about, what, 20 quid in 20 or something, pounds something a about there, you know. Three pounds for a win and two pounds for a draw, yeah. when I can remember. I mean, but I, I think that uh, at that time, uh, a lot of boys that played for Hearts did in fact want to play for Hearts. I mean, that's the, you know, I mean, I was only brought up just about half a mile from here, and mm. Bobby was an Edinburgh boy. There was a lot of Edinburgh people that people played for Hearts it. then. Mm. And I think that had a lot to do with it, the fact we didn't worry too much about money. The old cliche of we're playing for the jersey, if you like. I mean, over the years, they were sort of uh, akin to Chelsea, if you like, who never seemed to win anything. But there was always that charisma about them that the Hearts may well do it one day. It may happen one day. It did happen in the mm. 50s, you know. In 1959-60, Hearts won the league championship for the fourth time. The 50s had been truly remarkable, an unforgettable period, and it was fitting that that season also saw the League Cup retained with a 2-1 victory over Third Lanark, with goals coming from Alec Young and from Johnny Hamilton. The club also enjoyed its first truly competitive European experiences against Standard Liège in 1958 and two years later against Benfica. Often those games are commemorated with special gifts, many of which adorn the club's trophy cabinet. But all good things come to an end and as the light faded out for the decade, so it did for the Maroons too. Injuries took their toll in Bald and Warthaw. The trio disbanded and the greatest side in the history of Hart of Midlothian Football Club was breaking up. Willie Bald was not forgotten. These touching words are on a bench in Gorgie Road. The thought that from this life he's free leaves the heart so cold, so chilly. But to older fans he'll always be Tynecastle's own King Willie. Over to Wallace. That's top scorer this season with seven goals. Dangerous one. Quite well, penalised there for using his elbows to get up to that one. In 1964-65, Hearts had a magnificent season, losing the championship by an incredible .04 of a goal to Kilmarnock. One of the highlights was a fine win over rivals Hibs. Nice one out to Trainer. Found the chink in the Hibs defence and a good one in. And a beautiful header there by Alan Gordon. A wonderful headed goal after 28 minutes to put Hearts. One goal up in this derby, perhaps rather against the run of play, but a beautifully taken goal after smart work there by Wallace and Trainer. Well, that's really set the cat among the pigeons here. Hibs were rather doing more of the attacking. 
at that beautifully headed goal by young Gordon, who's studying economics at Edinburgh University. May very well inspire hearts, who, as I say, haven't lost a game here since 1952. And gaining in confidence all the time as a result of that very nicely headed goal by Gordon. Trainer, right footed, and Gordon again, completely in the clear, unmarked. Just too far ahead and cut off there by McNamee. The trainers picked it up, moving dangerously in the Hibs goal again. And just fails to get his crossover, but now Gordon's taken the block. Very neat play, and it's into Wallace inside the penalty area. And it's the second goal. Billy Wallace there, from inside the penalty area, right footed, shot hearts into a 2 0 lead after 31 minutes. And that makes it eight goals this season for Willie Wallace. Tremendous turn up, but a great display of chance snapping by the Hearts. Martin trying to chase that one, just failed to cut off that pass back by Anderson. And there goes the half-time whistle with Hearts 2-0 up with goals by Gordon in 28 minutes and Wallace in 31 minutes. Another left-footed one from Johnny Hamilton, swinging in, pushed out. Pushed out by Billy Wilson to Alan Gordon. And the young inside left, right footed, shot the ball cleanly into the net. Not a very good clearance there, I'm afraid, by Billy Wilson. But the chance snapped up very well and very smartly by Alan Gordon after 19 minutes of the second half. Here's Eric Stevenson. Put it away by Poland. Forward now to Gordon. Out on the right wing into the penalty area, right footed across, punched away, there by Watson and Tommy White, a cracking shot right footed, right into the middle of the goal, and now Hearts go 4-2 ahead in this rollicking derby game here in the rain at Easter Road. A good move there by Wallace, he's coming through and he's on, 25 yards out, and a low shot there, turned away for a corner by Wilson. Shevlin, well up again, helping on his attack. A high one, it's a good one. Onto the head there of Tommy Trainer, unmarked on the post, and with only two minutes left for play, Tommy Trainer has scored a fifth goal for Hearts, and it's now Hearts five, Hibs two. Hearts have really made the most today of every chance that has come their way, and given Hibs an object lesson in the a very vital art of goal scoring. In 1966-67, manager Tommy Walker finally parted company with the club and Willie Wallace was transferred to Celtic. The unsettlement did little to help a challenge for trophies and it wasn't until 1968 under new manager John Harvey that the fans were given hope with a Scottish Cup run that was full of drama. Donald Ford scored the only goal in the dying seconds of an exciting quarter-final replay against Rangers, but the final brought disappointment with a 3-1 defeat by the Dunfermline Athletic. Hobbs, who had more of the ball in this first half, set up a reply raid and began to look as though they really meant business. The ball came into the centre, but was quickly sent back to the wing. Ford returned it to the middle, and Dunfermline were under heavy pressure. After the loss of the second goal, Hearts replaced Jensen with Muller. Muller hit the ball, which deflected off Lung into his own net. At last, Hearts had scored. In 1974, Hearts proudly celebrated the centenary of their club's foundation. Ex-Hearts players, Willie White, John Hanlon, Walter Scott and John Lowe.
presenting a silver silver from the Motherwell Football Club to mark the heart centenary. And this same silver salver presented by Motherwell Football Club proudly stands as a tribute to the achievements of the past. Hearts were runners-up in the 1976 Scottish Cup final, but then disaster struck. For the first time in the history of the club, Hearts were relegated from top-class football. In 1978, they secured promotion to the Premier Division, but success was short-lived, the team once again suffering relegation and the sale of their star player, Eamon Bannon. I think this definitely suffered uh, from mismanagement, uh, not just um, the management of the team, but just, uh, I think, the boardroom level and everything, which definitely was a trend in Scottish football. I used to laugh in these days, like Tuesday morning, uh, we mean Willie Johnson running around the track, and at these times they uh, used to have the sheriff's officers in the place all the time, you know, pricing all the, the equipment. Like, and uh, I remember like, we used to have a laugh, but we bud would say, "Keep running like, in case we put a price on us." Hearts were very fortunate that they got it sorted out at that time when they got promotion. Um, they brought in Alec McDonald, Sandy Jarden, who did an exceptional job. They got things in order off the field uh, with, with Wallace Mercer, and. Uh, it, as I say, it was an exciting time and, and Hearts, for once, started to look as if they were going to be a big club again. So all of a sudden it, it, it went the other way and uh, Mr Mercer came into it. But like everything else, the board at that time were obviously trying to get players and we managed to get two, two big players and all of a sudden we had no money to pay them. And um, after that then we had to go with free transfers and kids. and. Um, but he's a big part in the club, there's no question about that. I sat down with the team skipper, which is Alec McDonald, and I said, look, Alec, we've got no more money. If we've got 10 new players, you and I are going to have to try and see what we can do. So he and I decided he wouldn't sit behind the manager's desk and I wouldn't sit behind the chairman's chair and we'd have a crack at this. And frankly, we got, I think we got the atmosphere right and we brought in one or two senior pros. Alec and I go back, I mean, I've got nothing for the greatest respect for him. He's like me, an ex-Blunos, you know, Rangers supporter. Good, good principles, 10 years at Rangers, a winner at European level and everything else. Great servant to the hearts. And the one thing, when the day came that he had to go, he stood up and came round and shook my hand and said, Mr. Mars, it's been a privilege working for you and for Hearts Football Club. A man of dignity. Dignity and pride are characteristics of everyone involved with hearts. 35 years ago, as a young assistant, Willie Montgomery looked on with tremendous pride at construction work in the new stand. Today, as head groundsman, he recalls the pitch conditions at Tynecastle when he first arrived. The very heavy conditions in the field it had been raining very heavily for about a month, I think, by the look of it, and it looked like a cabbage patch. However, uh, eventually it dried up and we got it sorted out. But uh, there didn't seem to be as much grass on it then, somewhere or other, as there is now. I remember we've had uh, better machinery on it or something like that, you know. A club can no longer survive on gate receipts alone. The sale of programmes, scarves and strips helped to bring the money in for equipment and for Willie's new machinery. Football clubs who want to progress have to make the most of their resources. Now, the money that comes through the turnstiles, while still very important, will not finance a successful football club in the modern era. So there has to be more to it than that. So the chairman and the directors have to raise the capital through their commercial acumen that will fund success on the pitch. Now that isn't easy. To be chairman of hearts is not a soft option. Your customers expect you, your supporters expect you to compete with the best, but realistically you do it with one hand behind your back all the time financially. So we've got to be that little bit sharper, our PR's got to be that little bit better. And commercially, we came up with a lot of bright ideas, which have subtly been, been, been covered by other clubs. And in fact, the commercial side of this business is really very profitable. I think a lot of people would be quite proud of, of that segment. But frankly, it is, it, is, it is secondary to the performance in the field. Because unless you have the product in the field, all the rest is a waste of time. Fancy stands and all the, 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 the woolly arts in the world won't in any way uh, change uh, the performance in the park. Even if you get the money side right, you're not guaranteed to get the football side right. That's in the nature of the unpredictability of football. 
But what is absolutely unquestionable is that if you don't get the financial side right, then you will never get the football side right. It's that important because the, the, the monetary aspects uh, are essential to bringing the right type of players to the club, to funding youth policies, to, to making sure that the, the club is in a position where it can compete with its rivals. We have uh, our youth policies very simple. We have a, a scouting system and really we only have four or five people at the winter who work on that system. But if they can get us some of the better kids from 13, 14, 15 year olds, and at 16 years old, they, they come in and work with myself and, uh, and Frank Connor. And from then, if, if they develop properly and if you've got the right type of players, then hopefully that uh, system then comes true. Go on again. Drive it. Oh. I've got quite a good man management. I can get on with people very well. Most people of the different facets in, in football, you know with the top guys, the young boys, the in-between boys, the reserves, and over the, uh, about 20, 20 years I've been in this side of the game. Probably that's my, my best asset, is the man management side of it. I know a wee bit about football as well, by the way. We wanted to try and, 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 and go for a broader market, because in the end, it, it, you know, it's like a bank, the first canon of lending, it's a judgment of the borrower. And Joe obviously thought this was a career move. I said to Joe, I remember taking him back to Heathrow, I said, what's your ultimate ambition in the game? He said, Wallace, it's to be manager of Manchester United. And I said, well, that's great. Because I said, if you want to do that, the only decision you've got to make on the way back to Bristol, apart from the money, is whether that ambition can be better calculated by coming to Hearts. Heart of Midlothian has had 17 managers since the beginning of the century. The decision to join was not an easy one. Yeah, it was a very difficult decision because I, I had um, started something at Bristol City um, and it was a good club and I uh, had built a team there and uh, there was a lot of hours went into it. But uh, I had the opportunity to come here, to come to the Hearts, uh, a team that I remember from my youth, uh, who I thought had potential. So after uh, a lot of discussions with my wife and whatnot, I, I took the decision to come here. And we're doing reasonably well in the league, um, but we're all we're all we're all striving to, to get better things. Uh, and this, the supporter, whatever team he supports, he wants to be wants to see his team winning and entertaining. All I can say is that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're doing our utmost. Uh, there are circumstances that are thrown in front of you. There are uh, injuries, suspensions, and whatnot. But um, all teams face these factors. Uh, you're just trying to get get a settled team and to get the best out of that, that team as you possibly can. One of the great stalwarts of the Jam Tarts in the 80s and 90s has been goalkeeper Henry Smith. Henry cost me £2,000 and we thought we were paying too much. But the reason we picked him is he had big hands. <laughs> and he was a free from Leeds, and he looked as though he could save the ball at crosses. I mean, that was one of the most subtle investments that we've made over a decade. That's not the only good business planning decision taken in recent years in the heart of Midlothian commercial offices at Tyne Castle Park. We were the first club in Britain to have internal television, first club in Britain to set up our own busing service for taking fans to away games, first club in Britain for European games to, to organise supporters and groups, the first club in Britain definitely in Scotland to have a major junior club. So we've tried to be in innovative in terms of the sport and addressing the social issues. Because I don't think it's just about being chairman of hearts. I think it's about debating and trying to, to, to give some pride back in the environment we have. We don't have the biggest stadium. We don't have the best stadium. But we do try and create a, wealth, a, a welcoming atmosphere, but a competitive one. It's about, I think, having a, a modicum of respect. And what we're now going to do is develop a new one and take the club into the next era. There's no debate about that. Whether I'm at the helm or not is really secondary to that. But frankly, if you look back at our last five, six years, we've either been second or third for four or five years in the league. And realistically, if Rangers won the league last year, Hearts won the league because we were second. Because if you look at the economic scale of Rangers Football Club, and they keep on promoting themselves as Britain's biggest club, and if you look at the number of internationalists, there is, a, there is a perceived implication of what we've achieved. And I'm quite proud of it. Um, I'm disappointed on a personal level and gut-wrenched for the supporters 
We can't physically put a pot on the table and say, that's the final edge after 10 years. But there are other things in life, and there's a greater being in life that will make that judgment. And frankly, that's what sustains me. There's an old saying in Scotland, uh, you know, things will come to you in the fullness of time. It may not be in my era. That doesn't mean to say I've not got to give it a go. And I have obtained much more out of my involvement in the hearts on a personal level as a human being than I have ever contributed. To me, uh, there's only one team in Edinburgh, <laughs> and that's the heart of Midlothian. It's my life, they're my life. But I've worked for all the time. But the best club to play for in Scotland. Spirit, strong spirit and belief in the, in the club. That was the biggest single thing for me, it was the real passion for the club. Because I love this club desperately now. It's got me by the throat. We've had a lot of happy times here. A lot of party, but a lot of happy times. Oh, for me, it's a way of life. Simple as that.